All right, somebody's got to keep me on time here. Um, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's the first time I've lectured here at this particular course. And I will tell you that I was actually on the subboard that helps prepare these questions for this exam between uh, 2005 and 2011. So it's a six year term. And the people who write these questions are your mentors and, and senior colleagues um, who get appointed to the subboard. So if it's something you eventually want to do, you also can um, maybe do it someday. Um, it's, it, they, they do try not to trick you too much. Um, you know, when I was uh, writing questions, it was a fairly rigorous process where we had to go through uh, at least three reviews uh, yearly before a question was uh, put on the, um, the either certifying exam or the recertification pool. So there are a couple of different uh, pools. And when I was on the subboard, you couldn't actually teach this course. They wanted to keep you a little bit separate from um, the clientele. Um, so I will say just one thing, know your translocations for oncology. I'm talking about leukemia, but all your translocations, just know those. Um, and, uh, and I would say that they were very assiduous, Guy already mentioned this, into making sure there weren't really like a lot of tricky questions. There are no double negatives, you could not do that. They had to keep, we had to keep the stems really pretty short, so you're not going to see these endless, you know, um, clinical scenarios, et cetera. So I, I think that the exam is what it is, you know, it's a, it's a rite of passage, um, but those are just a few tips. Uh, this is, these are my disclosures, um, and, uh, and I will um, say that most of these slides uh, were uh, pirated from Steve Hunger's talk, which he has given here uh, several uh, courses in a row. And it really is uh, to help course attendees pass the board certification or the recertification exam. Um, and it's not, again, as, as you've heard before, it's not necessarily to review the latest and greatest about ALL, which I'd much rather talk to you about. So anyway, but, but this is what it is. And, and the way he organized it, which I thought was great, was really just to go through the ABB um, Pediatric Hematology Oncology content outline for ALL. And so there are a couple things to know, um, which is there's some content specification statements um, that are in italics um, with their answers in black uh, font, as well as red uh, highlights. Um, and uh, there are some also shaded text that I'm actually not going to go through. The presentation in your handout are all of the slides, um, and they do cover the entire content outline, but it's way too much to cover in an hour, and we're already um, falling behind. So I am going to skip over some slides. As some of you know in the audience, I do speak a little quickly, um, so just follow along, and hopefully we'll cover uh, what you need to know about ALL. So there you go. <laughs> so the incidence in epidemiology, you need to know the incidence of ALL and AML and the peak age at which each of these occur. And you also have to know the concordance rate of ALL and AML in identical twins, which is not a bad question to know because um, occasionally you will, you will uh, come upon these patients and their parents will be asking you about both uh, identical and fraternal twins. This is the ALL epidemiology, which I am not going to go over because it is in the shaded box. And these are some of the genetic risk factors. I'm going to just highlight one thing because it does relate to some of the science I do, which is that several years ago we did publish um, the genomic landscape of hypodiploid ALL in collaboration with um, investigators at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And in that paper, um, when we looked at low hypodiploid ALL, which is defined as having between 30 to 39 chromosomes, we found that a high proportion of those patients actually had TP53 mutations. And um, of the 90% of patients who had a TP53 mutation uh, in their um, leukemia, about half of them were actually germline. So it really, for the first time, established that um, hypodiploid ALL is a bona fide lee fraumeni uh, syndrome disease. Um, and I'm not going to go over the rest because there's some very interesting papers that are listed here. I doubt um, uh, many of these particular papers will have made it into the uh, board questions. So um, leukemia as a relative proportion of childhood cancer, you've seen some of these graphs already, it's about 32, about a third of childhood cancers among those less than 15 years old, and about 13% of childhood cancers among the 15 to 20 year old uh, uh, subgroup. And uh, of the subtype proportions, um, remember this. So between the ages of zero and five, if you have a kid who presents a leukemia, by and large, it's going to be ALL. The peak incidence for ALL is between the ages of two and five. Um, less commonly is AML and rarely is CML. And other, which is the disease that I also like to study, is JMML, which is really rare. But it does happen also um, uh, in that age range. As you know, JMML is a disease of very young children. Um, between the ages of 15 and 19 years, ALL accounts for about 50% of the leukemia diagnosis, AML about a third, 
uh, and the rest are uh, CML and, uh, and other rare diseases. And again, it, maybe it's not so surprising as you look at the CML, you know, incidence, and you know about BCR able positive disease, right? As you get older, the incidence of BCR able positive disease goes up in the age um, in the population. So you can sort of think about that as a continuum. It is the leading cause of death in less um, in those patients who are less than uh, 20 uh, years. So how about the concordance between identical twins, those twins that, you know, share a sac or placenta? The concordance rates are close to 100% for leukemias that occur in twins when they are diagnosed less than 12 months old. And the concordant rates are about 10 to 15% for sort of typical childhood BALLs that occur after infancy. This concordance is primarily due to the prenatal acquisition of early or initiating chromosomal translocations um, or other genetic lesions, and then the transplacental transfer of the leukemia or the pre-leukemia cells to the other twin. So this happens in MLL translocations, and as many of you know, MLL has now changed its gene name, but for the sake of the boards, it is still MLL probably. I highly doubt anybody's went through and, and changed it to KMT2A, but just so you know that. Um, but it's also been shown in work by Mel Greaves' lab that, you know, the ETB6 runs one which is also known as TEL-AML1. So now you have to know two translocations for one disease, but um, that also can be shown uh, to, to transfer um, transplacentally as well in identical twins. Um, this is another uh, point on the uh, content outline. You know, know which constitutional genetic conditions predispose to the development of leukemia, and know that Down syndrome is associated with an increased incidence of both ALL and AML. There's a little trick here that we'll talk about in a second. And know the mechanisms by which immunodeficiency immunodeficiency states can have an increased risk for leukemia. So what are the predisposing conditions? So we talked a little bit about the leaf raumini syndrome, which you know is characterized, and you should know these syndromes as well, uh, by sarcomas, uh, osteosarcoma, et cetera, breast and brain cancer, leukemia, which is why the L is red, and adrenocortical carcinoma or adrenocortical tumors. And uh, we already spoke about the mutations in TP53. Um, there are also uh, patients uh, with ataxia telangiectasia with mutations in uh, the ATM gene um, that are predisposed to getting uh, T-cell ALL as well as T-NHLs. Uh, neurofibromatosis type 1. Uh, now, again, that's something that I'm interested in with respect from, JM, from the lens of JMML, but uh, they tend to get more myeloid malignancies, but they certainly can get um, lymphoid malignancies as well. And Bloom syndrome, again, uh, more AML than ALL. And I would say when you, you take a step back, I would say most of the predisposition syndromes tend to uh, confer more of an increased risk for myeloid disease than lymphoid disease. There are some congenital anomaly syndromes that you should be aware of that have an increased rate of uh, uh, developing ALL, which includes Klinefelter's, as well as some congenital immunodeficiencies. So how about Down syndrome? This is a very unique population, and as you know, we see babies in the nursery with uh, transient myeloproliferative disorders. We see babies uh, in the first year of life with Down syndrome who then develop uh, megakaryoblastic leukemia and MDS. And then we see older children who tend to develop um, ALL. They have 10 to 20 times the increased risk of leukemia. And it's interesting because it usually is patients who are less than 30. Um, when you get older, uh, you don't necessarily have as high a frequency of developing leukemia if you have Down syndrome. And um, the, the trick, of course, is that the relative risk of developing AML um, is higher than ALL, but Down syndrome, because of the sheer numbers, Down syndrome ALL is more common than Down syndrome AML, except for the first year of life. Okay, so except for the first year of life. And, um, and I would also say that I once read a review, it's, it's an older review now, in the British Journal of Hematology by Bev Lang, who sort of gave me a little way to think about how you deal with the three kinds of leukemias that you see in patients with Down syndrome, the TMD, the megakaryoblastic leukemia, and the ALL, and it was do nothing, do less, do more. So, you know, I think that you all know that when uh, patients with amegakaryoplastic leukemia and Down syndrome are treated with less cytotoxic agents in traditionally, that, that are traditionally used in AML, they actually have a superior outcome. So what about ALL? So it's about 3% of children with B precursor ALL have Down syndrome. Um, and it's very unusual to have a Down syndrome patient who presents with T-cell ALL um, or infant ALL. I won't say never, but it's quite unusual. And they also have a decreased rate of the common sentinel genetic lesions that we see in this population. So it's very rare to have an MLL translocation. It's very rare to have BCR able. Uh, and you can see, um, you know, ETV6 runs 1, and you can see trisomies 4 and 10, uh, but again, it's not so common. What is the most common, and probably has made it onto the, uh, the questions uh, for the boards, but I'm not sure, is that about half of them have a CRLF2 rearrangement with 
uh, a, uh, an alteration um, that sort of fuses uh, these two genes together, P2RY8, CRLF2. Um, and so that is really, uh, I think, the most common cytogenetic or, or um, karyotypic abnormality that is seen in um, patients with Down syndrome. Overall outcome of Down syndrome ALL is inferior to non-Down syndrome ALL, but it's actually equivalent if you limit the analysis to cases that lack sort of common sentinel genetic lesions, and there is an increased risk of toxic death in Down syndrome ALL. So uh, when you look at the protocols that we've developed for patients with Down syndrome, you'll notice that, you know, when we use methotrexate in patients with Down syndrome, we're not using the 5 grams per meter squared because they have a much higher rate of developing mucositis and toxicities from um, that. I'm not going to go into this, but it does uh, describe the immunodeficiencies that you can see um, uh, that, are, uh, that predispose you to develop a lymphoid malignancy. Um, and how about immunophenotypic differences? So you need to know how to tell on a flow plot, on the exam, the differences between ALL and AML, and I think Mark Fleming is going to be here to talk to you about morphology, and also I think I saw in his handout some beautiful fax plots. So I won't be going over fax plots, but I think it's important that you sort of recognize some common patterns uh, between um, lymphoid and, and uh, maybe lymphoid with some myeloid markers, which is very common, um, and, uh, and we won't probably have time to go over biphenotypic leukemia, but we'll talk about a few things. Um, so I'm going to actually talk a little bit about the shade, this, this particular slide, because I do think it's important. CD45 is used to define hematopoietic cells. That is something that um, we use on all our flow cytometric assays. Um, and for B precursor ALL, we typically see the, the uh, expression pattern of CD10 positivity, CD19 positivity, CD22, and CD79A. And I would say that some um, ALLs can express some weak levels of myeloid antigens, but that does not mean that they're biphenotypic. So the most common thing that we'll see is a little bit of CD1333. Sometimes that goes with ETV6, RUNX1, but that does not necessarily mean it's biphenotypic. In order to be biphenotypic, you have to also look at MPO. So that's just something that um, you should be aware of. For T-cell ALL, um, we look at um, cytoplasmic CD3, um, as well as surface CD3 and CD7. Um, and uh, again, I, I don't even know if there will be questions on the boards about ETP, uh, but it might be uh, something to sort of review before you go into that exam. Um, and then for AML, uh, obviously there are some more myeloid markers like MPO positivity, CD117, CD13 strong, and CD33 strong. Um, so uh, as I just talked about, myeloid antigen expression, so the CD1333 um, combination, this expression is common in ALL, but it doesn't have any prognostic significance. I already mentioned that it is particularly common in those patients with ETV6 runs 1, as well as patients who um, uh, have pH positive uh, disease. Um, MLL rearranged patients um, tend to be CD10 negative um, and CD15 positive, and they often express monocytic markers. And then uh, there are some um, differences between biphenotypic, where you have myeloid and lymphoid features on the same cell, or bilineal, where you have different populations of, you know, lymphoid and myeloid blasts. Um, so for the clinical and laboratory features, um, they'd like you to know the epidemiological, clinical and laboratory features that characterize B lineage ALL, mature or Burkitt's ALL, which you've just heard uh, quite a bit about, as well as T cell ALL. So again, um, for our patients, most patients, about 85% of all of our ALL cases are B precursor. Corollary to that is that about 15% of the time you have T cell ALL. And again, almost all B ALL cases are positive for CD19, 22, and 79, and most are positive for CD10, which used to be known as the common ALL antigen, CALA. That you will probably see on the boards, even though we rarely use that in uh, uh, common terms now. Um, they are TDT positive and HLA-DR positive, and about half of the MLL rearranged ALL patients, as I just said, they will lack CD10 expression. They're frequently CD10 negative and CD15 positive. Um, the early B lineage ALLs are cytoplasmic Ig uh, negative, uh, but there's a whole lineage, of course, of early, pro, pre, et cetera, uh, and they're just different combinations of those that you might want to create a table for yourself and just make sure you sort of know some of the differences. I think the most important difference on a practical level when you're, when you're a physician is really that B precursor ALLs lack surface Ig, right? So the, the surface, the presence of surface immunoglobulin really distinguishes um, uh, garden variety B lineage ALL from Burkitt's leukemia. And that is something that I think is a, an important uh, fact to know. Oh, I have it here. So the Burkitt's lymphoma leukemias um, also have a unique morphology, 
We've gotten a little bit away from morphology, but I think Mark's going to show you some great slides, and I have a couple of them in this talk. Um, so Burkitt's leukemia has this unique L3 morphology. You already saw that also from um, Paul's last lecture, and they express a, a surface Ig. And again, you've already seen the translocations that are involved with um, Burkitt's leukemia lymphoma, which also has a high frequency of CNS involvement when it presents with leukemia, as well as all of the classic, you know, um, aggressive features of Burkitt's lymphoma, high LDHs, high tumor lysis, uh, and uh, it can also be associated with congenital or acquired immunodeficiency states. Um, and again, as you have heard, um, we treat those patients according to a Burkitt's lymphoma therapy. Um, I will say there are rare cases that I have seen uh, where you have a pre-B ALL, no surface immunoglobulin, but they have a Burkitt's type translocation, and those are always sort of interesting cases to puzzle over and determine what the optimal therapy is. Okay, so I told you 85% are B lineage ALL. That means the other 15% are T ALLs, and uh, in general, T ALLs express um, cytoplasmic CD3, and most of them also express surface CD3 and are TDD positive. Remember that TDT is a, um, what is it, terminal deoxynucleotide transferase, so it's some kind of polymerase, DNA polymerase, but it's expressed on um, lymphoid cells, right, and, and blasts. So it's kind of a nice way to distinguish between myeloid disease and lymphoid disease. Um, T cell ALL often expresses CD2, um, CD4, CD7, and CD8. Um, and uh, most are actually um, HLA-DR negative. And I don't usually think of CD10 as a flow marker for um, T cell, but uh, I think that it can be expressed. There is a higher incidence of T cell ALL in, in, in boys and older teenagers and in African Americans. And again, it's kind of like Burkitt's. It's associated with um, just a, a high burden of disease, rapid turnover, tumor lysis syndrome. T cell ALL is also associated with a high white count, or can be, and mediastinal mass. Um, and I will say, uh, though this has changed dramatically since I was a fellow, um, there, we used to think of T-cell ALL as not as curable as B-lineage ALL, but I would say in this day and age with the therapy that we're now using, the cure rates for T-cell T -cell ALL really approach about 90%. But if you don't use as intense therapy, their outcome will definitely be inferior to B-lineage ALL. Um, the other thing that I'm sure many of you or some of you in the room know is that if you have a patient who relapses with T-cell ALL, it is very, very difficult to cure them, um, uh, especially if they, uh, they fail in their bone marrow. And clinically, you know, they tend to relapse a bit earlier as well. Um, so I don't need to go over this. This is what you learn as a first-year fellow, you know, recognizing the clinical complications that are related to the hematologic abnormalities in acute leukemia. Um, I will mention one different uh, subset because it's mentioned in your content outline. This is a rare form of BALL, but sometimes you can present with hypereosinophilia. The eosinophils are not part of the leukemia clone, but sometimes they can be sort of a passenger or a perineoplastic, if you will, and it's associated with a, a translocation of um, uh, chromosome 5 and 14 that brings the IL-3 gene under the control of the, the immunoglobulin heavy chain promoter. So anytime you have that immunoglobulin heavy chain promoter in relation to some, you know, interesting gene that might be a, a, a involved in lymphoid development, you can get ALL. You know, so the CRLF2 patients, you know, you get IgH and CRLF2. It's another uh, B lineage uh, leukemia. So the eosinophil count can be, you know, anywhere from 10 to 100,000. Um, and you might have a low percentage of marrow blasts. Um, but again, uh, you know, if you have a really good fish lab, you can ask them to do an immunoglobulin heavy chain probe, and they can usually determine uh, that uh, it's a break apart probe and that it's uh, translocated. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think that it's necessarily uh, related to an increased risk of treatment failure, uh, but, but certainly there are case reports out there that might lead you to believe that. Um, so the other clinical features for ALL, again, I'm not going to review because these are things that you should have learned in your um, fellowship training. Uh, as well as formulating a differential diagnosis for pancytopenia in childhood. Um, I will say, um, you know, well, well, there'll be a couple slides on sort of distinguishing ITP at first blush or, you know, JIA at first blush. You know, I, I, we'll, we'll get to those slides in a minute, but obviously this is the usual, um, you know, differential for these uh, diseases. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, and more on the differential. 
So, you know, every couple months our service gets asked to perform a bone marrow to make sure that the kid who's just presented with symptoms and signs consistent with JIA um, doesn't actually have leukemia because they're about to pulse them with steroids or start treating them with methotrexate. And I always um, sort of say to my team when I hear about that, you know, that's part of what we do. We just have to make sure sometimes um, that patients don't have leukemia. Um, so um, there are a small subset of ALL patients who um, have had suspicions of having JIA, and some are treated before we make the diagnosis of ALL. Um, and, and I would say that um, they don't necessarily do less well, believe it or not, even though we are all worried about pre-treating too many patients um, with, JI, with ALL who look like they have JIA. Um, I would say when you are thinking about such a patient, uh, there are some uh, reviews that suggest that patients with JIA may have a low white count, they may have bone pain, particularly worse at night, they may have a lowish but not super low platelet count, um, and other things such as clinical symptoms, of, clinical signs of rashes or other laboratory values um, such as a positive ANA may not be helpful. So if there's any concern on a practical level, we'll just do the bone marrow because it's just easy. Um, how about x-ray findings that are associated with ALL? Um, so again, I'm not going to go over these, um, but you know, it is kind of... Um, Nifty, if you go to your uh, radiology department and there may be an older radiologist who's sort of used to looking at um, x-rays more than some of our more modern uh, imaging, they may have in their teaching files, um, you know, plain films where you can see uh, some of the bands, the leukemic bands that we used to be classically called. Just take a look and see if you can um, find those. Those are pretty interesting. Um, and then uh, there's also this question on your content outline about the differential diagnosis of bone pain in a child. Uh, and I will just make the point that uh, about 40% of kids will have bone pain when they present with their ALL. That is probably one of the most common symptoms we see, along with, you know, pallor, uh, sometimes easy bruising. But it, it really is a very common uh, complaint. And that complaint can range anywhere from pain to actually refusal to walk. So um, the other thing that we, um, you know, we wrestle with when we're on call uh, is how you recognize uh, the clinical presentation of ALL to be different than the clinical presentation of ITP. And I think that as you mature as a physician, you get to know that, you know, children with ITP are really generally quite healthy. Now, you can get fooled. I've seen a lot of, uh, not a lot, but I've seen kids who look pretty healthy who also present with ALL. Um, but, you know, frequently with ITP, their parents can tell you, like, exactly, like, they developed this rash two days ago, or they started bruising three days ago. It's not like this gradual, like, uh, they, I don't know when that rash came up, and they're kind of acting cranky, and maybe they are really tired. It's, it's, it's a pretty sudden onset. Um, and so I... Um, in our center, uh, and in many centers, we, we not struggle, but we, we think about how you actually then um, perform diagnostic procedures on patients with ITP who you might have a suspicion to have ALL. Um, there was this uh, paper, actually, where, uh, from sick kids where they actually um, analyzed uh, patients who are presenting with similar symptoms. And so, you know, platelet count low, normal hemoglobin and hematocrit and, and a white count, so again, only one cell line down, and it's the platelets with no circulating blast, they really don't have ALL. Again, is it ever wrong to get a bone marrow? You know, it hurts. It's, it's not exactly the easiest thing necessarily, but I just said, you know, if they have JIA and you want to rule out ALL, it, it's a relatively easy test. So, you know, you can do it. But at least when you looked in this paper and you looked at almost 500 bone marrow aspirates uh, to confirm the diagnosis of ITP, None out of, um, of um, 332 that had the criteria above. So low platelet count, normal hemoglobin, and white count, and no circulating blast. None of them had uh, ALL. So I think that's an important distinguishing feature. Um, the other thing that you'll also get called by, I think, are sort of general pediatricians who have had a CBC on a kid who's coming to their office, and they have an absolute lymphocytosis. And so this is just a, a, a review of what you might want to think about. And of course, infections always come to mind first. And especially even in California, we've had a, a recent surge in uh, pertussis. And we probably have a few less patients that are immunized. But um, we think about pertussis, EBV, you know, CMV, uh, and the other conditions here. Um, and of course, all of you also know that sometimes when you're getting that CBC at an outside hospital, sometimes their, their CBC machine won't necessarily call blasts, et cetera. 
Um, so uh, we will talk about um, CNS leukemia, the diagnosis, the manifestations, as well as um, testicular disease, which is pretty rare at diagnosis, I would say. Um, and uh, we'll just go on to extramedullary disease. So what is the definition of CNS involvement in ALL? CNS, one, is the absence of blasts on a cytospin preparation. So you get your LP, you, you, do your, you get your CSF from your LP, and you send one for your cell count. That goes to the lab, they spin down the cells, and they look at the cells on that prep. For us, we also send off a separate um, tube for cytology. And for our hospital in particular, sometimes those are not as helpful because they go to a different lab and they get spun into a block, but sometimes they sit there and they don't get um, run quite as quickly. But the cytospin is a, is a lab medicine-based test, um, and, uh, and we really we do go by that um, because you'll get the cell count. So again, CNS1 has no blast on the cytospin preparation, regardless of the number of white cells. CNS2 is when you have fewer than five cells per microliter of white cells, but the cytospin's positive for blast, or you have greater than white cell, five per microliter white cells, but it's negative by the stein hertz blier algorithm, which is just a ratio of white cells to red cells uh, compared to what your um, peripheral blood looks like, and we'll look at that uh, calculation in just a minute. And then CNS3 is the presence of greater than or more than five uh, white cells in, per microliter as well as a cytospin that's positive for blasts or has, um, uh, and that's positive by the steinhardt blier algorithm as well, or clinical signs of CNS involvement, like a cranial nerve palsy, um, you know, a, 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 an abducens nerve palsy, et cetera. And so just remember that five cells is CNS3 with blasts. So the steinhardt blier algorithm was designed to help evaluate traumatic LPs. And, um, this is when your CSF white cell to, to um, CSF red cell ratio is more than twice the blood white cell over blood red cell ratio. And so there's just a, there's just a calculation down here that you can do the math on. And it does um, help uh, when you have a traumatic TAF, for example, and they're circulating blasts. So I won't go over all of the, the calculations, but I think it's a fairly straightforward um, formula. Um, I, I would say that, that patients who, who come in with CNS disease, they are frequently asymptomatic. Um, and when they do present um, with symptoms, the symptoms and exam findings are usually um, related to increased intracranial pressure. So headache, vomiting, lethargy, some irritability, some neck pain. And then on exam, papilledema, sometimes they'll present with seizures, and uh, sometimes they'll also have cranial nerve palsies. Um, and so uh, there are some uh, phenotypes and situations in which you might suspect CNS involvement more than others. Um, so it's fairly common in infants and in Burkitt's. Um, it's intermediately common in TALL, and it's pretty low, actually, in non-infant B-lineage ALL. You see it's only about 2% in our B-lineage ALL patients. I would say that... Um, if uh, the, the pearl I once learned from um, Howard Weinstein, who was uh, one of my attendings when I was a fellow, is that if you see an infant uh, with leukemia and they have a chloroma that you can either see or they, they have um, uh, on the face or on the scalp, you definitely want to actually get a, an MRI scan on them. This doesn't have nothing to do with the boards, but I can't just do just the boards. Um, but you, you, want, you may want to get a, uh, an MRI scan on them because chances are they're going to have something in their brain. Uh, so just take a look, just to be sure that you're okay to do the LP, so that kind of thing. Um, so that's just something to know. Um, and how about testicular involvement? This is super rare. Um, you know, I was uh, one of the study co-chairs for O3B1, and that enrolled over 11,000 patients. I think we heard about like three of these. I mean, it's really super rare. So um, one to two percent of boys present. They, I think it's even lower than that. Um, and it can be associated with other high-risk features um, like TALL or those with a high white count. And it's a painless, very hard, lumpy, and large testicle. Involvement should be confirmed by biopsy. But we have been trying, at least in the newly diagnosed setting, to move away from testicular radiation. If there's a complete response obtained to induction therapy, if you are at all concerned, you should probably re-biopsy them at the end of induction. Um, and uh, I would say an isolated testicular relapse is much less common with, most, with the modern effective therapy. Um, the reason why we're sort of moving away from testicular radiation um, for those patients who have a nice response to their first month of therapy is the data from, I think it was the Dutch group, that looked at using high-dose methotrexate to effectively treat uh, boys with testicular disease. Um, 
Oh, here. So how about uh, extramedullary relapses also? So there is um, an importance of the time to relapse. So this is a paper um, that was published several years ago on looking at the outcomes of almost 2,000 patients who had relapsed on legacy CCG protocols. And uh, this is just looking at CNS relapse versus testicular relapse. Um, and the time to relapse is counted from the time they were diagnosed. So um, this is just looking at their overall survival. And you can see, you know, the later you get from your initial diagnosis, and this is not rocket science, the later you get from your initial diagnosis with a relapse, the better you do. And in fact, it is true also that um, the later you get from extramedullary relapses from your initial diagnosis, the better that you do. So if you're 36 months from your initial diagnosis and you have an isolated CNS relapse, you have about a 78% uh, five-year overall survival from that event, and similarly for, um, for uh, testicular relapses. Um, and I would say, you know, isolated CNS relapse um, accounts for probably 15 to 20 percent of relapses. Again, this is a little bit of a moving target as our current trials are maturing. Um, but the other bottom line, and this is highlighted in red, is the outcomes are much worse uh, for both of these groups if they occur less than 18 months from diagnosis. Okay, and that's also true. Again, the earlier you relapse, whether it's in your bone marrow, your CNS, or your test testes, the worse you do. Um, so there's some morpholo morphology questions, um, and you know we're moving away from morphology a little bit. Though I don't know if Mark's here yet; he <laughs> wouldn't be super happy. But uh, you know I, I can't remember the time when somebody was telling me about L2 blasts. We look at L1, we look make sure it's not L3. L2 blasts still are on the board exams. Uh, they are a little bit larger. They have some more distinct nucleoli, and they frequently have more cytoplasm. He will show you pictures, I'm sure, of that uh, tomorrow. This is a classic L1 uh, ALL, you know, scant cytoplasm, high nuclear to cytoplasm ratio, open uh, chromatin, you know, cells are turning away, et cetera. There are no um, uh, vacuoles in it that would make you suspicious of uh, Burkitt's uh, leukemia. This is a, an image, it's not super great, but it was taken from an image bank from ASH, um, but you can see the, um, the little vacuoles in there um, that are uh, commonly seen in Burkitt's on, on uh, right game sustains. Um, and this is also an atypical lymphocyte, and I think that, again, I'm not a morphologist, but what I can tell from this is that there's more abundant cytoplasm, there is a, nucle a nucleus, but the chromatin seems to be much more dense, uh, and it also kind of, um, kind of adheres to the, to the red cells. So uh, that's just something that I look at when I'm looking at uh, smears. Um, and then this is granular ALL. And again, uh, Mark will give you a, a nice tour through morphology, so I will uh, move ahead. But there's some granules in the cytoplasm. Um, so we already talked about TDT. Um, it is lost. It's a marker that's lost very late in T and B cell development. Um, and, uh, and I would also say, um, that um, the differential when you're sitting there with a new patient and you're not exactly sure what it is, but it looks like it's L1 ALL, you know, if it's a two or three year old, chances are it's L1, it's ALL. But, um, but you can also get faked out by AML. Um, and so I think that until you have that flow results back, you, you can't absolutely be sure. So we always refrain from telling the patient their diagnosis based on morphology alone until we get that flow cytometry back. Um, almost all B lineage ALLs are DR positive. Most TALs are DR negative. But again, some AMLs are DR positive, and so that's important uh, to distinguish among uh, those different diagnoses. And then I'm not going to read through this. This is something you will probably have to um, memorize and recognize uh, for your exam. The one thing I will say again, and this is not... Um, a surprise is that mature B will have a surface Ig positivity. So I've said that a couple of times. I think that'll be important for the exam. Um, and uh, and for this particular um, uh, relationship between CD10, uh, I will read this off because I do think it's important because CD10 is one of our most common antigens that we see um, early in B cell development and is lost late. So we see a lot of ALLs that are CD10 positive. But the very, very earliest kind of B cell ALL can be CD10 negative. And that, again, I'm going to say this again because this will come up on the exam, MLL uh, rearranged leukemias frequently can be CD10 negative. And as many of you probably know, um, when babies present with these MLL rearranged leukemias, sometimes they have sort of a myeloid flavor. They think they're a very primitive sort of STEMI kind of leukemia, and that sort of goes along with that. 
um, about half of CD10 negative ALLs have a, an MLL rearrangement, and about, but, but the corollary is that about half of MLL rearranged cases are CD10 negative, so it's not a perfect system. Um, okay, so this is important. So again, you have to know your gene rearrangements for this exam, uh, whether it's ALL or Ewing sarcoma or desmoplastic small round cell tumor or synovial sarcoma, et cetera. And, and for ALL, I think it's important to know the prognostic significance of the molecular translocations that occur in ALL. Um, and, uh, and it's also important to know uh, that um, ALL is associated with antigen receptor gene rearrangements. So this is just a chronicle of how you actually rearrange your immunoglobulin heavy and immunoglobulin light chains. Um, and the heavy chain actually rearranges before the Ig light chain, and it's alphabetical, so kappa before uh, lambda. Um, the Dj rearrangement occurs first, and then the V region rearranges. And then almost all B lineage ALL has an Ig rearrangement. And the other thing that people are always surprised at is that a significant percentage also have a T cell receptor gene rearrangement. And I think this is becoming um, more important for you as clinicians because of this new, you know, um, high throughput sequencing MRD test that is becoming more rapidly available. So you'll see these reports of all these various rearrangements and people will say, but they don't have T cell ALL. But it's important to remember that patients with B lineage ALL can have T cell receptor gene rearrangements. Um, infants might lack some of these because, again, infants are a, a little bit of a different uh, breed. Um, and almost all T cells have TCR rearrangements, though this ETP subtype that has been recently described um, actually generally doesn't have a T cell receptor rearrangement. It's a fairly, fairly primitive leukemia. So that makes it difficult when we're thinking about, you know, following patients with just high throughput sequencing strategies, which we've not done yet, because a, a substantial proportion of these T cell ALL patients are not going to be able to be followed using this methodology. This is just a, um, a graphic of, of the, um, uh, how this actually happens and how there are unique clonotypic markers for patients. And again, in your B cell repertoire, I am not an immunologist, but in your B cell repertoire, you're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of these, you know, and they're not going to be clonal. But when you have a leukemia, one of these is going to predominate because it's going to come from this whole um, basket of leukemia cells. Okay, this is um, a good uh, slide to remember. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to say too much about this slide except just know what this is. Um, cryptic means you can barely, you can rarely see it on a cytogenetic karyotype. It has to be done by a fish. Um, but, you know, I, I will just say a couple of things, actually. So the ETV6 RUNX1, which was previously known as TELAML1, and you will probably see both on the exam, is one of our most common molecular features in ALL. It is cryptic. It can be detected by fish, and the outcome is outstanding. It's less common in patients that are over the age of 15 years, but it is also still associated with an outstanding outcome, particularly if they respond rapidly to their induction therapy. Um, in the old days, the 119 uh, translocation, which is uh, TCF3-PBX1, which is also known as E2A PBX1, in historical studies, they didn't have as good an outcome, but with our more modern, dose-intensive, you know, multiple-phase therapy, they actually do very, very well. So that has lost prognostic significance over the decades with our intensive therapy. Talked a little bit about um, MLL rearranged uh, disease, and I will just say that in contrast to babies where the outcomes are really poor for MLL rearranged disease, it's actually not horrible for patients who are over the age of one, especially if they have a rapid response to therapy with our current um, uh, protocols. Um, and in fact, the other thing you'll see is the 922s, the BCR ABLES. Again, they used to be our, one of our worst performing uh, subgroups, but now actually we treat them with uh, imatinib or dasatinib uh, with the backbone of chemotherapy, and their, um, their outcomes have dramatically improved. Um, and I won't talk about the Burkitt's uh, translocations because you've just heard about them. Um, so let's go on and uh, talk a little bit about clinical and laboratory findings that influence prognosis. Okay, so your baseline characteristics. It's just your age and white count actually really define your NCI risk group. Um, immunophenotype is, is less a component of that, but it's really, remember, if you are less than 10, greater than age 1, you have a white count less than 50, you are standard risk. If you are either over the age of 10 or you have a white count greater than 50,000, you are high risk. Very simple. Any pediatrician uh, can uh, know that in their office. Um, 
we don't tend to use B and T to risk stratify in the children's oncology group. We just allot them to different protocols, which are essentially on the same backbone, but we don't necessarily um, integrate that into the NCI risk group. We do, um, we do measure, though, the presence or absence of extramedullary disease because it influences prognosis and it actually dictates the need for specific therapies. And we also take note of their sex, race, and ethnicity. It's important, but it's not used for current treatment stratification. Um, so what, what I would say is that really um, two things, genotype and response are really the most important um, metrics for predicting how somebody's going to do in the current age if you are diagnosed with ALL. So the genotype strongly influences your prognosis, your treatment stratification, and now uh, the use of targeted therapies like TKIs for pH positive ALL, TKIs for pH like ALL, which is probably not yet on the board exam. Um, and then uh, in, a, in, a, in a very important um, metric, response to therapy is actually the strongest prognostic factor. Perhaps I should say this again. Perhaps I should say this another way. Um, uh, therapy is the most important prognostic factor, right? That's the obvious thing, because if you don't treat them, then they're not going to do well. But once they start therapy, response to that therapy is the strongest prognostic factor. So we just went over what standard risk is. Um, and uh, if you are a standard risk patient and you have a nice response to therapy, your EFS is greater than 90%. Um, when you start adding like ETV6 ranks 1 and you know, uh, double trisomy of 4 and 10 and a rapid early response, you can get up to 98%, which is awesome. Um, in general, standard risk and high risk, based on these NCI risk groups, two-thirds standard risk, one-third high risk. That's sort of a good number to remember. Um, and our current EFS for patients with high risk ALL is, is within the 75 to 80%. And it's achieved with more intensive therapy, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and again, outcome is still quite poor for infants. Uh, less than one year of age. So we still have a long way to go for those babies. Um, so when you actually look at what we do with these patients once they present, we know we have to do some sort of risk-adapted therapy because we know that if you take a high-risk subgroup, we know that they will fare poorly with less intensive therapies that have high cure rates in lower-risk subgroups. So that's why we treat high-risk ALL with a four-drug induction and uh, more intensive consolidation. We know that the outcome of high-risk subgroups can be improved with more intensive therapy that might not be needed for low-risk subgroups. And again, as we talked about, some of the prognostic factors of genetic translocations can disappear as the therapy is intensified or improves. So um, in B-cell ALL, so the other thing I, I uh, teach fellows when I'm on with them and we have a new look, um, the initial white count is a very significant risk factor for, for B-lineage ALL. Higher is absolutely worse. Um, you know, greater than or equal to 50,000 per microliters used as our traditional cutoff to determine, you know, NCI high risk versus standard risk, but obviously it's a continuous variable. And so we see the best prognoses in the lower white counts. Um, but when somebody presents with a white count of 250,000, um, the fellows in my program um, know that they should sort of be hoping that that patient actually has T-cell ALL, because T-cell ALL there's very little prognostic significance to the presenting white count, as opposed to B-lineage ALL, where there definitely is um, an association with the worse prognosis, the higher your, um, your white count is. Um, and then there's also this uh, observation that age is a significant risk factor. So you recognize age subgroups as a prognostic factor for infants less than 12 months of age, um, but that in general, the older you are with ALL, um, the worse you also do. And again, we've said that, you know, between two to six years is the prime um, age uh, for our patients, and luckily that also is the best subgroup, which is partly why ALL is such a great and curable disease right now. It's not a great disease, but it's a curable disease. Um, and for infants, you know, the younger you are, especially with the, um, with the MLL rearrangement, the worse you will do. Okay, so we're going to talk about response to therapy. So you have to know that the rapidity of response to chemo is predictive of outcome, and you have to know the methods that we use to measure the rapidity of response, including what the contributions are for day 8 and day 15 bone marrow aspirates, as well as peripheral blood assessments, and know a little bit about the methods that quantitate minimal residual disease, which I will call MRD, um, and know the rationale for using MRD and predicting outcome for ALL. So, um, Lots of different groups study ALL, right? It's the COG, which used to be CCG and POG, and um, the Day and Farber, and St. Jude, and um, the BFM, which stands for Berlin Frankfurt Munster. And there are German colleagues who, for many years, 
have used this strategy to determine who's going to need more therapy versus who's going to need a little less. They basically give one dose of IT methotrexate as well as seven days of steroids. And at the end of those seven days, they just look at the absolute blast count in a patient's um, blood. And if, you're, uh, less, if you have less than 1,000 blasts in your, per microliter in your peripheral blood, um, you are risk stratified in the BFM to be a good responder. If you have more than 1,000 blasts per microliter in your peripheral blood, you are designated a poor responder. And this is a very classic uh, consortium protocol definition of response, as, our, as many of our European colleagues do. Um, it's quite elegant and it's very powerful. Um, we in the CCG, uh, historically, um, we, we were very interested in, in figuring out if we could also replicate these findings, though we use more drugs in that first week. And so we looked at day eight um, or day 15 uh, bone marrow responses. And we looked at whether or not the achievement of a day, essentially 15 M1 marrow, would um, correlate with a good outcome. And in fact, it does. But we also found out that we could actually also use, in our recent protocols, peripheral blood to measure very similar things. And so we no longer actually use bone marrows at day 8 and day 15 because we know we can use a surrogate marker of day 8 peripheral blood by flow cytometry to predict um, outcome as well. And we also know when we look at some of our legacy studies, CCG 1961 uh, uh, is uh, the one that Steve cites, that intensified therapy does improve EFS for patients who do not achieve an M1 bone marrow by day 15. So we also have all sat at the microscope. And you look under the microscope, and you can look at a whole bunch of cells under the microscope, but it's pretty crude. Um, it's accurate. It's reproducible. Um, and it's a way to identify patients who are likely to have a good or bad outcome. You can usually look at uh, you know, signs of induction failure, et cetera. But we wanted more sensitive metrics to determine whether or not our patients were um, responding to induction therapy. And so in the United States, because we, um, in the COG, I should say, because we enroll about 2,000 patients per year in our studies, we needed a fast way to do it as well, and we needed a reproducible way. And so we chose um, to use uh, flow cytometry uh, to look for MRD, which is defined as the presence of cells following chemotherapy below the level of morphologic detection. And our, our flow-based um, assays are sensitive to about 1 in 10,000. Um, the Germans actually use a PCR-based strategy, so and that gets to about 1 in 100,000. So just know there are different ways that different consortia define um, MRD positivity. There's different thresholds, and there are also some different techniques. Um, and, uh, and I just told you that we no longer use the day 8 and 15 morpho bone marrow morphology because we really think that um, uh, the day 29 bone marrow uh, flow cytometric method is uh, more sensitive and perhaps the day 8 peripheral blood. Um, so I've just spoken about um, how you can detect leukemia by a flow cytometry. Part of the reason, again, we see a lot of patients on our protocols, but importantly, it's applicable in almost all cases and it's fast. You send that sample to Hopkins or Seattle, you have the answer in about 48 hours. Um, Yes, it's a little bit less sensitive than, mo than the molecular methods, but you send the molecular methods off, yes, you get a degree of sensitivity more, but you actually have to wait about a week or two at least. Um, and it's not always applicable. And the same thing will hold true for the uh, high throughput sequencing strategies as well. They can't type about 5% of patients, this PCR amplification of specific antigen receptor loci, that they have to identify a diagnosis and then they follow through with the patient. That also... Um, uh, is only applicable 90% of the time. Um, but, but when you actually compare any, the results, you know, when you look at the germs, you look, we're very similar. So we, the, both technologies, to, both techniques are robust. We just see so many patients on our trials that we have to do something that's very reliable and fairly quick. Uh, and we, when we, you know, we act on them now, so we have to be fairly uh, quick. Um, and, and, you know, in the early days, we did a little bit of work on um, looking at RT-PCRs of translocation-derived fusion transcripts, and really that has only been um, super well developed for bcr able positive disease, and even then, uh, the kind of um, bcr able fusion gene that's associated with CML. Uh, and again, I, I just, uh, I already showed this, but this is what uh, people are using when they look at molecular MRD. So um, when you look at flow cytometric analyses um, and you look at the end of induction, so your day 29 bone marrow MRD via flow, um, you can see that patients who have greater than 0.1% um, of leukemia cells in their bone marrow did quite poorly or do quite poorly. This study is COG um, or POG 9900. 
It's uh, patients who um, were seen at legacy POG institutions, and importantly, this is when we were first measuring MRD, but we did not act on it. So the clinicians had no idea what these actual results were, and they were really just treated based on their initial um, risk group and their cytogenetics. And, um, and, and when you look at the patients who had a day 28 less than 0.01%, which is the majority of them, they had an 88% uh, percent, um, uh, EFS, five-year EFS, and you can see the middle in there. Um, I will say that the middle line, the MRD threshold uh, in the middle was 0.01 to 0.1%, uh, and that is the, the, uh, the level that we are currently using in our current uh, protocols, so that anybody with a level of greater than 0.01% is deemed to have a high MRD. The other thing I'll point out, though, is when you look at this um, graph, you can see that the most number of patients have um, less than 0.01% MRD. That's almost 1,600 patients. But because the number's so big, when you look at the number of patients who relapse, 51% of the events are in the MRD negative group, just because the number's so big. So it shows you that we still have a ways to go to really pinpointing accurately who's going to fail our current therapies. Um, so how about cytogenetics and molecular diagnostics in ALL? Uh, and then as a side point uh, for those of you who are treating these patients, um, you know that when you send that really hard to get bone marrow, you know, sometimes it's so hard to get leukemia cells and you send it off for cytogenetics, and then a week later your CRA says they're normal and you're like, ugh. Oh. You know, a lot of times ALL cells don't grow. They don't grow that well. So you just have to be a little careful with how you interpret it, which is why we do fish, right, for all those things. And you can do more than what we require on the studies, but that's why we do interface fish. Um, so, um, you know, Something for you guys to review uh, is just to look at what the difference is between hyperdiploidy, you know, more than 2N, hypodiploid, less than 2N, and the relationship between chromosome number and DNA index. Um, and the DNA index is a test that we don't usually do anymore, but it basically charts how much, you know, DNA content there are in your cells, so you can pick up a hyperdiploid clone fairly easily. Um, and you also, uh, I've talked to you a little bit already about the Philadelphia chromosome and how important it is to now treat those patients with TKI um, as well as chemotherapy and how they do quite well. Um, and I also um, shared with you that you need to know all of those translocations cold. So telema one is the same thing as ETV6, RUNX1, and it is the molecular counterpart to the T1221, the cryptic translocation you cannot or rare, very rarely see on karyotype but can be picked up um, uh, always by fish, um, and uh, also the, uh, the molecular abnormalities in infants. Some of this is repetitive, and the reason why it's repetitive is because it's important. So you will need to just know that, and, and if anything um, helps to just hear it, I hope that will help uh, you with recall as you hear my voice shouting in your head when you're taking the test. <laughs> that would be my son's biggest nightmare. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Chromosome number in ALL, hyperdiploid, DNA index greater than 1.16 or 53 or more chromosomes. Again, excellent outcome. The two best outcomes we have, trisomy 4, 10, and 17, actually 4 and 10 are excellent as well, and, um, and uh, ETV6, RUNX1, also known as telema one uh, as opposed to hypodiploidy, where it's very unusual to have a hypodiploid uh, ALL patient, but their outcomes are super poor. Um, and the fewer chromosomes you have, the worse you do, which is probably not a big surprise. So near haploid is really the worst of the worst. Okay, how about pH positive ALL? So this is an interesting, this is actually really an interesting disease because um, about 3% of kids are uh, pH positive, and it, it's uh, more common in the high-risk age and, the, and patients who present with a high, a high white count, which is not a surprise, right? Age and white count um, and early response are important prognostic factors um, in pH positive ALL. Um, but we know that, um, that, that before we introduced tyrosine kinase inhibitors, they had a very poor outcome, and they um, were routinely subjected to stem cell transplant. And again, this is a treatment paradigm that has changed as we have uh, conducted our clinical trials. We don't necessarily automatically go to stem cell transplant anymore. Um, and so when you look at some legacy uh, papers of how these patients did without TKIs, they did terribly. I mean, 1985 to 1996 and 1995 to 2005, the seven-year EFS was between 25 and 30 percent. Um, and so uh, I think that what's important is as we have run these clinical trials, we really do make strides in improving outcomes for these subgroups of patients. And so this was the study that Kirk Schultz ran, um, AALL0031, 
where it was um, lots of very high risk patients, but specifically for those patients who were pH positive, um, they were treated uh, in increasing cohorts of um, sort of discontinuous and then continuous uh, TKI imatinib with chemotherapy. And, and the reason why they did it discontinuously is because it was the first time, so this is in your lifetime, this is the first time we actually introduced a TKI to the backbone of chemotherapy. So then by, finally, when you got to cohort five where they were getting it continuously um, and followed them for outcome, they did great, 72%, seven-year EFS. That is mature data, and um, it actually led... Uh, to the FDA to approve uh, the use of imatinib for pH positive ALL in pediatrics. So I think that's a really important study, and I think it has changed the paradigm of how we think about precision medicine and molecular abnormalities that can be targeted with specific therapies. So unlike B lineage ALL, T ALL is a little bit more difficult, and I think we're still getting a handle on how we actually identify patients who are going to do poorly with uh, therapy. So fusion genes are very rare. Hyper and hypodiploidy are very uncommon in TALL, and there are few lesions that have a major prognostic significance in TALL. Um, their translocations may be more common with T, uh, the T cell receptor, um, and there are some that are recurrent, but none occur at a high enough frequency for us to really pinpoint prognostic significance. Um, and so I think it, it, it remains a, a bit of a difficult landscape, though, you know, we are so happy that they are doing so well with our current therapies. Um, okay. What are those therapies? What are traditional therapies? So what are the most common drugs that we use that are the most valuable for remission induction? So corticosteroid, dex and pred, or pred, vincristine, asparaginase, some form of asparaginase, uh, with or without an anthracycline. And that anthracycline is, gets added on in the COG protocols if you have, um, if you have uh, high risk disease. Um, the other thing to know is that, you know, that delayed intensification that we use, um, looks complicated, you know, puts people at risk for fever neutropenia. It's a really good thing for standard and high-risk ALL. The benefit has been established in multiple randomized trials done 20 and 30 years ago, and we also identified that two of these phases, two DI phases, is actually no better than one, and that came about after we looked at the CCG 1961 and 1991. So single delayed intensification for all patients with ALL, um, and, uh, and we will continue to talk about risk-adjusted therapy. I'm not going to go over these uh, curves too in too great of a detail, but this is a study that Paul Gainan ran in the 1980s where we actually didn't use the BFM backbone. We used something that CCG had, um, had uh, crafted, which was much less intense when you read the papers than what the BFM used and what we are commonly using now if you are at a COG institution. And you can see the differences in outcome. Um, New York 2, I believe, is, uh, is something that they uh, still use a riff on from Memorial Sloan Kettering. But when you look at the EFS um, from the regimen that the, our German colleagues have been using, uh, that's where regimen A, in contrast to what we had been using, and again, this is the 1980s, you can see that they were far superior. So when we got the results, that study actually closed early. When they got the results, they actually um, started to use and incorporate um, uh, the BFM strategy into how we have uh, now treated um, uh, uh, high-risk ALL and all ALL, actually. So this is just for high-risk patients, um, and uh, the definitions of high-risk were maybe a little bit different back then than they are now. And then they also ran a study looking at intermediate-risk patients and, again, found um, that adding a DI improved outcome, um, but that for patients who we now call standard risk, there wasn't really a huge benefit uh, to long-term survival when they added uh, donamycin. So that's part of the history behind why we use three drugs for our standard-risk patients and four drugs for our high-risk patients. This is also a really impressive slide. This is something that, um, that is published in a, in a um, JCO article that Steve wrote. And this is actually looking at overall survival in sort of three different eras. Um, I kind of like to think of it as my, fel my residency, my fellowship, and then my attendingship. But um, it, when you go down, so from the group, so less than one year, one to, not, one to 10, greater than 10, greater than 16, boys and girls, you can see how well we've done over the years with outcome. And when you look at the, the change in the risk of death from 1990 to 2009, it's kind of remarkable for all groups except for our infants. So we continue to have struggles with infants and how we treat them, but for, for nearly all groups, um, uh, they are doing much better these days than they used to, and that also includes African Americans and patients with T-cell ALL. 
So uh, we've already talked about the uh, principles of treatment for different groups of ALL, which is clearly just COG. So I apologize to those of you who use St. Jude or Dana-Farber strategies. Um, but again, three drug induction for standard risk. We also use Decadron for the little kids um, because they have a lower rate of osteonecrosis. Um, and uh, for the high risk, we use uh, four drugs, uh, which include um, uh, prednisone, um, essentially. Uh, and for those patients who are young but who have a high white count, we'll use dec Decadron for 14 days. And then we have differences in consolidation, less intensive for standard risk, more intensive for high risk. Um, interim maintenance, less intensive for standard risk, more intensive for high risk. DI is the same. Uh, and then I, I don't think you'll get asked questions about like a second Capizzi, et cetera, because those are some questions that are ongoing. Uh, currently, we are still using maintenance therapy with Q4-week steroid and vincristine pulses, and we do not have the data yet released on our most recently conducted uh, averages protocol 0932, uh, but uh, so clearly you're not going to have a question on the boards for that. Okay, how am I doing for time? Because, let's see. Uh, okay, I'm out of time. It's 5.06. Don't you want to hear more? <laughs> okay, so... Prevention of CNS leukemia, that was the most important thing in the 1970s, was to re recognize that you had to um, treat the CNS. Okay, so that was really super important. And over time, we have reduced the number of patients, this is the bottom line, we reduced the number of patients that get exposed to cranial radiation. They used to use craniospinal, we don't do that anymore. And in fact, I would still say though that CNS3 patients with diagnosis, they still, in the COG system, get cranial irradiation. Um, so I'm going to skip through these because you know um, that, and, um, and you will also know sort of the important take-home point also is that systemic therapy is really important to prevent CNS relapse as well. You can't just treat their CNS, you must treat them um, very intensely uh, to prevent CNS relapse as well. And that also actually is really important when you relapse in, in your CNS, is you have to intensely treat them systemically because uh, an isolated CNS relapse, if not treated well, will always result in a bone marrow relapse. Um, okay, and you will, uh, you can look through the rest of these slides uh, regarding CNS therapy and adverse effects. Um, I think it's important to know some of the late complications of cranial radiation with respect to um, uh, the incidence of brain tumors, as well as sort of short term when you receive radiation, there's something called the CNS uh, sort of somnolence or radiation somnolence syndrome that lasts, uh, that starts about six weeks after you finish your radiation and lasts for a couple weeks and then patients uh, recover. Um, and these are just uh, lists of what the acute complications are of CNS directed therapy that you should look at. Um, as well as the late uh, complications that we've discussed. Okay. Um, and, um, I, you know, again, I, this is sort of clinical medicine, right? You know, when you have a patient uh, and you have a, a patient who's seizing, we worry about metabolic abnormalities, uh, cerebrovascular accidents, drug toxicities from methotrexate or IT chemotherapy. If they're on asparaginase, we worry, like I said, about clots, et cetera. So just, you know, those are sort of the differentials um, that we think about uh, when we have patients who seize. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go over sort of the complications of ALL induction therapy. You've already talked about uh, tumor lysis. We obviously always worry about infections. We do worry about hyperglycemia, but we really try to avoid changing any kind of steroid dose if you will, um, and we also worry about thrombotic uh, episodes, which I agree with Leo. You know, we see more thrombosis than um, bleeding when we uh, think about asparaginase complications. Um, and again, uh, Pat Brown will talk to you about AML, but we rarely use uh, phoresis uh, for uh, patients with ALL, except if they're a baby, maybe with a white count of greater than a million. All right, so you know how to manage um, pancytopenia during ALL induction with uh, antibiotics, and these days I think that people are very quick to pull the trigger on antifungals. Um, and uh, you've also heard about tumor lysis management. Okay, so I think, um, you know, in the interest of time, I, I could keep talking. I know um, Leo has a scintillating talk next on research methods, so I, I think that the relapse content is, um, is here. Uh, you know, I think it's really important to know that the time, and I said this already before, how long it takes you to relapse, if you are going to relapse, that is really important. If you relapse fast after your diagnosis, that is much more difficult to cure. I would also say I don't know how many, um, how much the test has evolved to really incorporate some of those new and novel immunotherapies. I suspect not quite yet. Um, so I, I think there are probably still older questions on the role of hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which we certainly still use. Um, but I don't, I don't think, I don't know, because it's been five years since I've written questions. I don't think you're going to get too many CAR T cells, et cetera. 
Okay, so with that, I think um, I'm sorry that I've gone over. I'm going to um, just highlight that slide, and I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. All right, thanks. Sorry I went over.